Darn. I'm just, I'm exhausted hearing that. I think, I think I'll go to sleep and come back in April or something. <laughs> it's going to be a very exciting month, the month of March, and I love that. And uh, currently, I really, uh, I'm really pumped about March the 17th. Um, St. Paddy's Day, right? And uh, when we're going to go, basically, we're going to two services, but the bottom line of that is from March 17th, we're going to make a lot more seats available for people to be able to come in and to worship with us. I'm excited about that, and I'm looking forward to seeing what God is going to do. And as I've said before, those services will have a slightly different feel because the place won't be as jammed or crowded, uh, but the good thing is you'll be able to get a seat in the cafe to get your breakfast. And uh, the good thing is, you know, um, if you were to look in the garden some weeks where our younger children are, it's like unbelievable how many kids we've got there that God's blessed us with. But I'm sure the helpers in there who do a fabulous job will also be happier if they're spread out over two services. So um, it's going to help in a lot of ways. But the main thing is it's going to create space for more people to come in and come to know Jesus, like so many of you have here through our Sunday morning services. Uh, let me just remind you that we do support a number of ministries and missions on a monthly basis. And uh, we do that through, we invite folks at the start of every month to make a special missions offering, which you can do in exactly the same ways for our general offering, just earmark it missions. And it goes out of here this week to a number of different things. And uh, I tell you, if, if, ever, if ever I was excited to see our missions giving at work, it was yesterday afternoon uh, when I was over in the 180 center with a great family from our church that I've known for about 30 years now. And uh, Rose O'Brien's son, Jay, was graduating from the 18-month recovery discipleship program. And to see the way God has absolutely transformed his life. And then part of it was they invited the graduates who were there to come and pray over Jay. And there, were, there was all this load of graduates. And I looked at those and thought, thank God that we've got a connection here. And we play a small part in what they are doing because every one of those people was a life that was headed for total ruin, but God rescued and turned around. So thank you for your missions giving. Uh, the 180 Center is just one of the ministries who receive the benefits of what you give at the beginning of every month to missions. Now, on, on, on the topic of missions, Last week, I, uh, I referred in the course of teaching, I referred to our um, support of kids in the DR, and, and um, I was told afterwards, it's a pity you didn't give us a heads up, because we've actually got a board with the pictures of some of the kids on who still need sponsors. So if you're interested in sponsoring a child in the uh, school that we help to run in the Dominican Republic, then uh, do take a look at the, the board outside today. For $30 a month, you can make a difference in a child's life. They will receive a good, solid education. They will receive teaching uh, in the basics and the essentials of faith and of the Christian life. And as I said last Sunday, it isn't just helping these kids get a start in life. What we're actually doing is investing in their eternities. And uh, so if you're able to help with that, Please do talk to uh, Susan. She'll be by the board outside in the foyer after church today. Okay. I've got to practice preaching a little bit shorter, you see. Or else I've got to take advantage of this week and next week when I don't have to preach a bit shorter. So who knows? Let's pray. God, thank you. Thanks for the joy of being together. Lord, thank you for just a great crowd of people and a great place to be in where we can bless you, praise you. Lord, remember who you are uh, and hear you talk to us. Lord, just speak to our hearts. We all need you in different ways. And so, Lord, as I share your word, I pray, Lord, that it will become life to everyone. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 
So as Charlotte mentioned, we are in the last part of our transformed series today. So since January, when we started it, we, we've looked at a whole bunch of areas. Today is the seventh and the final of, of where, where the Bible gives us some real clear direction as to how those areas of our lives can be transformed. We talked about spiritual health, physical health, mental health, emotional health, relational health, financial health. And today we look at interesting kind of topic or title, vocational health. Now, unless you think it's about how to get a good job, that's not what I'm talking about. Because our vocation can be, but it's not necessarily the job we're doing. Our vocation is what our life is about, what our purpose really is, and what our direction is. And the fact is that God wants our lives to reach their maximum possible potential. Now, if you've got an idea of something you feel that, that you could be doing or could be trying, and, and you're not sure about it, I, I, want to t I want to tell you, come and talk to me. Because one of the most frequently used phrases when folks say to me, I'm thinking of doing this, what do you think about this? My answer is real simple, go for it. In fact, you don't need to come and see me now, there's the answer, okay? <laughs> It's, it's, it's go for it, go for it, go for it. What's the worst thing that can happen? What's the best thing that can happen? Go for it. I tried a zillion things in my life that didn't work, but I'm still alive and breathing. Amen. We tried a whole ton of things as a church that didn't quite work the way we thought they would, but you know what? We're still here and doing good. Amen. Go for it. Make sure you reach your full potential in life. Embrace the dream that God puts within you. Embrace God's purpose for your life. Now, here's what we're going to do this morning. I don't want you to switch off because we're going to come to look at one of the best known stories in the whole of the Bible, all right? All right I'm going to read a few verses from 1 Samuel 17, and, and, and let's see if you remember this. The Philistines now mustered their army for battle, and encamped between Succo in Judah and Azekah in, in some place. <laughs> Saul, Saul countered with a buildup of forces at Elah Valley. So the Philistines and Israelis faced each other on opposite hills with the valley between them. Then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was a giant of a man measuring over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet, a 200-pound coat of mail, bronze leggings, and carried a bronze javelin several inches thick, tipped with a 25-pound iron spearhead. And his armor bearer walked ahead of him with a huge shield. He stood and shouted across to the Israelis, do you need a whole army to settle this? I'll represent the Philistines and you choose someone to represent you and we'll settle this in single combat. If your man is able to kill me, then we will be your slaves. If I kill him, then you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel. Send me a man who will fight with me. Now, we use that story and love that story as a kind of metaphor for improbable victories. The overwhelming favorite goes up against the one in a million long shot and the underdog wins the day. Interesting when you look at the story of David and Goliath because our, our idea is here's David, he's this teenage boy um, who had been a shepherd and he has this Little slingshot is all that he's got to go up and face the, the, this great big giant. But, but in actual fact, a sling was a lethal weapon. It, 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 it was more than something that, you know, kids might make and play with nowadays. It was, there were a whole army divisions of people who had slings. 
So you'd have the archers and the archery division. You'd have the footmen with their spears. And you would have the slingers. And that was a whole army division because the fact is that they could, apparently someone who was experienced with a sling could rotate that sling six or seven times a second and the stone would come out of it approaching 80 miles an hour. That means that, trust me, I did this calculation very precisely. Which means I read this in a book. <laughs> that if Goliath was 100 feet from David, the rock would reach him in less than a second. The Valley of Elah, where, where they were when they met, where David picked up his stones for his sling, the, val the Valley of Elah contained a lot of barium sulfate, which was common there, and is a very heavy rock. So I did a second calculation and I worked out this, that a very heavy rock would have had a stopping power equivalent to a bullet from a 45 caliber handgun. That's what killed Goliath. David actually had a serious weapon in his hands. Let me just say a couple of things about Goliath. Interesting that Goliath was preceded, was led onto the battlefield by an attendant, by one of his servants. Someone brings him down to the place where the fight was supposed to take place, which is interesting really. If he was the greatest warrior that there was amongst the Philistines, then why is he being led by the hand like a preschooler crossing the street? And then the Bible account in, makes it clear that Goliath moved very slowly. So he was a ferocious warrior who needed to be led by the hand and moved very slowly. And then there's another factor. It looks like from a few things he said, he couldn't totally figure out what was going on. D David came down from the hills and he, and he basically, he had a staff, a little bag of rocks, and, and that was it. But from the outset, Goliath didn't seem to know what was going on. And, and he just stands there and says, come to me that I may feed your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. But David's there with his slingshot. And he obviously wasn't going to come near Goliath. But Goliath didn't get it. And then as David got a little bit closer to him, carrying his staff, his slingshot, his stones, Goliath says, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? David didn't have sticks. He had his staff with him. So, is there something going on with Goliath? And, and, and the fact is, endocrinologists say, yes, there was. <laughs> and, and their title is longer than mine, so I agree with them. Here's the thing. Goliath was huge, right? The most common source of giantism is a condition apparently called acromegaly, which I might not have pronounced right. And it's caused by a tumor on your pituitary gland that causes the overproduction of human growth hormones. You're learning a lot today, aren't you? Yes. Right? All right, let's bring it down to a little bit lower. Um, for those of you who were into WWF or WWE, Andre the Giant suffered from this. Okay, that's, 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 what, that's what he had. Actually, the tallest man who's officially ever been on record, Robert Wadlow, who was eight foot seven tall, he had the same disease. And many people who have that, their disease have se severely restricted vision. They've got real problems with their eyesight. Goliath needed a guide. He was moving slowly. And he was a bit confused about what was going on. All right, all that just to say this. Here's what I get from the story of David and Goliath so far. Maybe you are better equipped than you think. And giants aren't all they may seem. You just get a hold of that for a moment? 
You are better equipped than you think, and giants are not all they may seem. So often we restrict our lives and we limit our, our own ambitions because we don't realize what our own capabilities are, and we, but we look at obstacles, but those obstacles we're looking at are not as impossible as they seem to us. And what I want to get into today is, is how to transform your vocational life, how to reach for the heights, how to achieve the fullness of what you could achieve in life in whatever way that may be relevant to any of you here this Sunday morning. I'm talking basically to the principle. The obstacles that we face in life are, are often not nearly as insurmountable and depressing and overwhelming as they seem at first glance. But a lot of us spend our lives holding back in fear because we don't think we could. We'd fail. It wouldn't work. But if you look closely, you come to realize giants can be defeated, especially by those who have God with them. Some of you take that home with you today, will you? Giants can be defeated, whatever that might be in your life right now. Giants can be defeated, particularly by those who have God with them. Give up your small ambitions and dare to believe for what God's got for you. Three steps to transforming your life and work. Number one, Remember how God has helped you in the past. Remember how God has helped you in the past. Remembering that gives me confidence for the future. Remember the time you thought you wouldn't make it? But you did. Remember your time you thought it was the end? Take a look around. You're actually here still. Remember when you thought you were at the bottom and you'd never be able to climb out? Look at you now. Remember how God has helped you in the past. Because here's, here, here's an important principle for us to remind ourselves of. God never changes. God never changes. God doesn't love you one day and not the next day. If God's been there to help you in the past, then God's there to help you today, and God will be there to help you in the future. He willingly will help your future in big ways. So, so you know the story of, how the story of David and Goliath went. David said, hey, I'll take him on. And, and, and then King Saul says, well, if you're going to go out there, you at least got to be protected. Wear my armor. And David tries it on and says, not my size. And, and here's what he says to Saul. But David persisted, when I'm taking care of my father's sheep, he said, and a lion or a bear comes and grabs a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and take the lamb from its mouth. If it turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. David was insane. You've got that, right? <laughs> right? I mean, the guys are even mad. I mean, if, you know, if I'm looking after the flock and a lion comes, I hide. He says, I, if I'm looking after the flock and a lion comes, I get a club and go after it. It's like, what is the matter with you? And he says, when I get it, I take, I take the club out of its mouth. And if it chases me, I beat it to death. Saul must have had serious issues with this young guy. I mean, he says, I've done this to lions and bears. I'll do it to the he this heathen Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who saved me from the claws and teeth of the lion and the bear will save me from this Philistine. Now, here's the serious side of that. David looked back on his previous experiences and said, look, God's delivered me from danger before. 
God's delivered me from, from, from situations where I was facing death, and he's done that before. And the God who's delivered me from a, from, from a terrifying situation in the past is the God who will deliver me today. Amen. And thank God he is for you and for me. That's who God is. That's how he is. And it's so important for us to remember the, the, to look back and remember what God has done for us and what he has been to us in the past and from that position then to have confidence looking forward for the future. Don't ever live restricted and inhibited because of things you feel you could never do, you couldn't pull off, but recognize this, with God with you, there is no limit to what you can achieve. Don't live with small ambitions and come to the end of your life wishing, wishing that you'd done more, wishing you'd accomplish more, wondering if it could have been different. Seize life by the horns and go for it. Whatever area of your life, with God's help, transform your vocational thinking. There's an interesting verse in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 2 where, where God is speaking through Moses to the children of Israel and says this, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years. Just remember. Remember how God led you, how God provided for them, how God protected them. Psalm 126 is a, I, I love Psalm 126. It talks about, it says, it, it, it says that when God's people are celebrating um, freedom and victory, it says, then the heathen are going to say the Lord has done great things for them. And, and then in verse 3, here is the reply of God's people. The Lord has done great things for us. That was great. He has done that for four people here this Sunday morning. <laughs> that is wonderful. I'm glad I'm not alone. Hasn't he? The Lord has done great things for us. Thank God. Yeah, he really has. The Lord has done great things for us. Remember who God is. Don't be overcome by frustration and fear and don't limit yourself unnecessarily. Remember what God has done for you. And then the second thing is this. If we, if we are going to see our lives reach their potential and fulfillment, you've got to reject negative people. Oh, you're on to that one, right? Right? Reject negative people. Ignore the dream busters. You know, you know why we're where we are today as a church? Because I ignored the dream busters. Yeah. Well, you can't do that. No, that was not going to work. You know, it's like, no, that's, that's no good. No, no. There are always people who see the negative. God bless them. Put them in a corner by themselves and let them depress themselves and not you. But, but when it comes to David, his own father didn't rate him. Do you, do you remember some of you have heard this story plenty of times before? When, when, when Israel was uh, going to get another king, God sent Samuel to the home of Jesse in Bethlehem. And he said, I want you to anoint one of his sons who's going to be the next king. Some of you know this story well, right? So Jesse proudly receives the prophet and lines up his fine sons. And, and as would be kind of the case really in those days, the oldest son was kind of the prince among the family. So he brings the oldest son out and says to Samuel, here he is. And Samuel says, it's, it's a great phrase in the King James. I, it's kind of a put down. And Samuel looks at him and says, the Lord hasn't chosen this. It's like, whoa, <laughs> way to build a guy up. But, but he, he went right down the line and said, okay, well, here's number two, son. Here's number three, son. And then he goes through the whole lot. And Samuel says, well, are there any others? So 
about this, the boy in the field looking after the sheep? Jesse didn't even rate his son enough to include him in this event. It's like, let's bring in the boys who matter, and, and hey, hey, the runt of the litter will stay out there, and he will look after the sheep. His own father didn't rate him. And as David actually started to get ready to go out and fight Goliath, he didn't get any encouragement from anybody else either. In fact, his brothers turned on him and said, who do you think you are? Think you're the big guy all of a sudden? Not a single word of encouragement. The whole army, the soldiers who were scared to death didn't encourage him as he went out. The king didn't encourage him. They were listening to the voice of the enemy. 1 Samuel 17, 16 says, Each morning and evening for 40 days, Goliath took his stand and made his speech. And they'd all heard Goliath thundering out his challenges and threats for almost six weeks now. And that's what had filled their minds. Let me tell you something. Don't listen to the people who tell you it can't be done. Your dream is your dream. Find a way to make it happen. They don't have your dream. They don't own your dream. They haven't heard the things you have heard. They, they, they haven't thought over the things that you have, been, you have been thinking over. They just hear it and they respond on what seems to be a logical level and it might be because they care for you. But if you listen to negative people long enough, you'll get negative. It is highly contagious. Negative people should be isolated for at least five days. Let me, let, let, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. <laughs> Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse 4 says this. If you wait for perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. Amen. If you wait for perfect... If you want all your ducks in a row and everything lined up before you make a move, you're going to stagnate and you're going to spend the rest of the days where you are right now. Especially for those of us who are followers of Christ. Here's the thing, there needs to be, there always needs to be a spot in our planning for God, at least a little bit. It's what I like to refer to, some of you heard me describe it, it's the God gap. It's going to be, you know, I, got, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, but I don't know what happens here. Good, let God do a bit, because he likes to, and he can. If you wait for everything and check off the list, it's never going to happen. But when you start to move and when you step out in faith, you start to see God filling in the gaps for you and God doing what only he can do. See, David didn't listen to negative people. He, he, here's what the Bible says was one of David's common practices. 1 Samuel 30, verse 6. David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Don't look all the time for affirmation and confirmation from other people. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Remember God's grace. Remember God's provision. Remember God's kindness, his power, his love, his faithfulness. And remember the greatness of God and recognize the fact if God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. God and I are a majority. Encourage yourself in the Lord. There will always be a hundred reasons why you won't succeed in your mind but you have to reject negative people and put your trust in the Lord. Reject negative people. And then finally, rely on God to help you. Rely on God. And God can be relied on. I, I heard a great expression yesterday I'd never heard before. 
And it was this, you can't let God down because you're not holding him up. He's holding us up. And he has never let us down. Right? Never let us down. Rely on God to help you. Expect God to help you. Don't hang with fearful people. Don't hang with small-minded people because if you hang with fearful people, you'll become fearful. If you hang out with cowards, you'll become a coward. If you hang out with bitter people, you will become bitter. You you know, sometimes it, it just takes somebody with a fresh approach to life. Here's the whole of the Israeli army, totally, thoroughly intimidated, and then this kid from a village comes in with a fresh pair of eyes, but of faith in God, somebody who's nobody and says, hey, we can take him down. Great, slam dunk, we can do this. He expected God to help him for his glory. Sometimes you can get so caught up in the weeds. You fail to realize we're God's people. God is with us. And God's plans for us are good and they are great. And if you're going to continue to pursue your dream, you've got to just recognize, hey, with, I'm, going to, I'm going to press forward with God's help. You know, it, it's, to me, it's kind of very simple. I, I've had folks who say, you know, I'm not sure what the Lord wants me to do. What do you think I should do? You know, um, maybe I'll, I'll fast for a while. Say, Whatever. <laughs> um, you know, or... Or, 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 or what do I do? What, what, what do I do? You know, should I, how, how do I find some help? How, should I find somebody who's a prophet and ask them? And it's like, most of you know me, right? So I try to keep it down to earth and real. Here's what you do. You give it a try. If it works, it was God. If it doesn't work, ah, well. Sorry. Now, if you came here today looking for something profound, that's about as good as it gets, all right? <laughs> but, but the reality is, you know, the reality is God's committed to blessing us. And he'll bless us even through our mess-ups. We don't try to make them, but they happen. And you know what? I tried something. Oh, that didn't work after all. Okay. Where do I go next? Because God's never going to leave us. He's holding us up. He's never going to drop us. Keep it simple. Wise people. Keep it simple. Rely on God to help you. 1 Samuel 17, 45. Here's David replying to Goliath. David answered, you come at me with a sword and a spear and a battle axe. I come at you in the name of the God of the angel armies the God of Israel's troops, whom you curse and mock. This very day, God is handing you over to me. I'm about to kill you, cut off your head, and serve your body and the bodies of your Philistine buddies to the crows and the coyotes. The whole earth will know there's an extraordinary God in Israel. And everyone gathered here will learn that God doesn't save by means of sword or spear. The battle belongs to God. He's handing you to us on a platter. And you know what happened? Of course you know what happened. It worked. It worked, right? Impossible situation. But David stood there trusting God, remembering what God had done for him in the past, refusing to listen to the negativity and relying on God to help him. Listen, this is not the test run. This is our life, right? We only get one round. This is it. This is it. Live this life to the full. Your vocation, vocation is is calling, right? And and for, for every one of us here today who knows God and trusts God, God called us for a purpose. And I want to encourage you to make sure you fulfill God's purpose, that you accomplish all you could 
in the course of this life. Transform your vocational health. Don't live, live aimlessly. Don't live bogged down. Don't live frustrated. But really, open up your eyes to the vision God will give you and then go for it. And if the vision terrifies you, good. Good. We are sitting here this Sunday morning because over 25 years ago, I left my house with a mixture of terror and excitement. I had left secure pastoring behind me and gone out on a total limb. And now we were driving to the location we were renting for our very first Sunday morning service is Grace Church. And this was either going to be the most exciting move I've made in my life or it was going to be a total disaster. I'd left everything else. I had nothing else to go back to. Either this worked or I don't know. Or I don't know. This is working so far. This is working so far. My passion to reach people who needed Jesus. God is fulfilling that week after week after week through our church family. But it took going out on a limb with no guarantees and saying, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go for it and see what God will do. I don't know how that might apply to you today, but in whatever way it does, my encouragement is go for it and see what God will do. Amen. Let's stand and pray together, please. Father, you are the giver of life. You're the giver of eternal life. And Lord, your promise is that from you we'll receive life that is full, that is abundant. And God, I pray for everyone within the sound of my voice today that you will show us the keys to living that full, fulfilling, abundant life that you promised us. Don't let us settle God, I pray for anything less than that, but may our lives fully achieve the purposes for which you brought us to this world. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you.